holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with His glory. And when you think of that, recognize that we just joined them. (laughs) So that kind of puts that in perspective a little bit. I want to ask you to take your Bibles and turn with me, if you would, please, to the book of Colossians. Colossians, we're going to get into chapter 2 today. Colossians chapter 2. Before I begin, I wanted to share with you a little story about a small southern town. There was a trial in that small southern town, and the prosecuting attorney called his first witness... And she was a grandmotherly, elderly woman who took the stand. And he approached her and asked her, Mrs. Jones, do you know me? And she responded, well, yes, I do know you, Mr. Williams. I've known you since you were a small boy. And frankly, you've been a big disappointment to me. You lie. You're a cheat. And you manipulate people. And you talk about them behind their backs. You think you're a big shot. When you haven't the brains to realize that you'll never amount to anything more than a two-bit paper pusher. Yes, I know you. Well, the lawyer was stunned, needless to say. And not knowing what else to say, he pointed across the room and asked, Mrs. Jones, do you know the defense attorney? She replied again, well, yes. I've known Mr. Bradley since he was an itty-bitty youngster, too. He's a lazy, mean-spirited man, and he has a drinking problem. He can't build a normal relationship with anyone, and his law practice is one of the worst in the entire state. Not to mention he's a philanderer who is right now involved with your wife. Yes, I know him. Well, the defense attorney nearly died. And the judge asked both of the counselors to come and approach the bench, and he whispered, If either of you two idiots asked her if she knows me, I'm going to send you both to the electric chair. So I... Yeah, this woman's been around forever, and she knows everybody. Well, I thought that was an appropriate way to begin, because I think (laughs) it's important for us to remember the Lord knows us. And you know what? He still likes us. (laughs) That's really good, isn't it? He's for us. And what I'm wanting to talk to you about today is being perfect in Christ. Being perfect in Christ. So... You have no small, you know, thing to aspire to here today, okay? We're all going to feel like, you know, maybe we're not measuring up if, if we were to take it at face value. But I believe what we're going to see as we look at this together that perhaps we'll be able to get something for our hearts that will make us a, a, appreciate what God has in mind and in store for each of us. Beloved, today, I want you to see that in this passage that we've been looking at, in chapter 2 especially, Paul is basically summing up a lot of what he's said already. And he does that uh, by saying these words in verse 1 of chapter 2. He says, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches, of the full assurance of understanding and to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And we're going to stop there because what we have to do is we have to go back to chapter 1 to find out some of the context of this. But what I want you to see is that this is a group of people that he is writing to who literally have in their hearts a desire for deeper knowledge. They find it to be very uh, stirring, thrilling, and encouraging to have what we might call deeper knowledge. It is fun to know the backstory behind things. It is fun to ha- have uh, maybe the backstory when somebody else doesn't and they're going to be surprised. You know, I believe all of us are going to be surprised when we get home. <laughs> the Bible says, I have not seen, ear, have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of men the things that God has prepared for them that love him. You know, there's going to be some pretty exciting things to discover. But what I want you to recognize is that Paul is summing up some of the things he said back in chapter uh, 1. One of the things he does is he begins out of the gate in chapter 1 to praise them for their faith. If you jump back into chapter 1 in verse 3, he says, We give thanks to God, praying always for you. We give thanks. Why? Verse 4 
since we heard of your faith and of your love and of your hope. Okay? So he is starting out of the gate by saying, we're thankful for what we've seen God do in you. We're thankful for that. And he's pleased, therefore, with their faith. Faith is the thing you want to hone in on there. He's pleased with their faith because, you know, their faith had an impact on their lives. Shouldn't our faith have an impact on our lives? Shouldn't it just do something to the way that we conduct our day-to-day affairs? And there's always going to be fruit if you have real faith. The Bible says that in so many words. If you look at it in verse 6, it says uh, it, that you have this faith that begot love in verse 4, and it's for the hope which is laid up for you. And this is a faith which is, uh, which is uh, based in the gospel, verse 5, and it says it's a faith which has come to all the world, and it says, and bringeth forth fruit. This faith that God has designed for us to embrace is a faith that literally brings forth fruit, verse 6, in all the world and in you also. So he was very pleased with that. You know, maybe when you first started out in the faith, you, you found yourself very uh, enthralled by what you had learned. It was something that really did take you by storm. Man, you trusted Jesus, and man, lights went on in your heart and your mind. You began to like people you didn't like so much. You began to curb your tongue. You began to, you know, begin, you began to read your Bible uh, you began to like things you didn't like before. You liked going to church. I remember a fellow I led to Christ way back in the early 80s, uh, actually mid-80s. He was a man who had been to church most of his life, a small town down in Virginia. And his wife and his son that they had adopted came to church. And he just wouldn't come. And I was the youth director, and we would go on trips, and I'd say, Hey, Ed, would you come with us? Why don't you come with us? And he would. He would come with us on our whitewater rafting. He was an outdoorsy kind of guy. He actually built a log cabin. He was about 30, 33, 4 years old, something like that. He's got this real, you know, grassroots, down-to-earth kind of thing going on in his life. So he loved that stuff. And he would join us. So we recruited him. He'd come in. And what was fascinating about it is after he'd come to one or two events, I went over and sat down with him on his front porch. And I talked to him. And he said, well, I just never thought, you know, much of it, you know, and about being saved and all that. Oh, yeah, my wife, she talks to me. And I said, well, let me, has anybody ever shared with you how you can know you're going to heaven? And he said, well, you know, I pretty much you need to go to church. And I said, no, no, let me, let me share with you. And I shared with him. The guy got saved that day. And after he got saved, he said this a few weeks later. He said, you know, when I used to go to church, I always felt like I was in the stands observing. This is his own way of putting it, observing what was going on. But now when I go to church, I feel like I'm on the team and I'm engaged and what I hear is for me and it's exciting. You see, when you get saved, there's going to be fruit and the first fruit is going to be love. That's what we see when you look at it in verse, uh, in verse 4. He says, we heard of your faith and of the love. See, God gives a love. The Bible says in Romans 5.5 5, that this hope that he gives us that makes us not ashamed, it says it makes us not ashamed because of the love of God which is spread, shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. Can you get your mind around the fact that God made you to love people? He, he did something there. You began to care about what you did with somebody who offended you because you loved, for Christ's sake you loved. The problem is, is that sometimes our feelings can only get us so far. You know, you get all lit up about God, but if you don't get in and add to your faith virtue and your virtue knowledge, uh, you know, you're going to have a problem because faith, yes, makes us to love because we see that God loved us, loves the world, loves people that we've had a hard time with, but we also see that we uh, still are in our human flesh. And what happens is the feeler gives way to fear after a while. Somebody has said the opposite of faith is fear. And if faith brings forth a feeling of love, then it's only natural to consider that sometimes fears can come in and encroach upon our feeler. You may want to love people, but then you begin to think about sharing Christ with them and you get a little nervous. (laughs) Because you're lit up, but they don't get it. It's like you get really excited about a new thing and they're like trying to figure out what is he talking about. For you and for me who've been in the, wa- in, in the faith for some time, we know that we sometimes appear to the world in which we live as we share about our faith, like uh, Lot must have uh, appeared to his sons-in-law. His sons-in-law said, you need to get out of there. His, he, Lot said to his sons-in-law, you need to get out of the city. The Lord's going to rain fire down on the city. 
And you may remember how quaintly it was put. It says that Lot was unto them as one who mocked, as if he was making a joke. And they laughed it off because they couldn't see it. And they perished in that devastation in Sodom and Gomorrah that night. My point is, is that sometimes it's easy to let our feeler get displaced by our fears. And that's what had happened with the Colossians. They were lit up. They had faith. It had given way to a love, very naturally so. And it was based upon the hope in verse 5. He says all of this was for the hope. And the hope that is laid up is a hope of eternal bliss, uh, 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 eternal well-being, being in the good side of all things, the absence of all negative things, being so uh, well taken care of that the very streets are paved with gold because we'll not want for anything. Man, if this street out here was paved with gold, it wouldn't be long, would it, before people would begin to chop that baby up and go get some stuff. Because we all, there's, there's no end to the desires that can well up in our hearts. I remember years ago, I had a roommate uh, who was from uh, Charleston, West Virginia, which is evidently the capital down there. He was very proud of it. He literally, he literally had a poster about that big of Charleston's Capitol building. And I began to wonder about him when I found out what his name was. His name was Grover Cleveland Darby, Jr., that's a handle. <laughs> That's a handle. But he loved his, his beloved uh, state capital for whatever reason. And he told me the story that years before, uh, when that building was built, that they actually had gold on the top of that building. And people began to scale that building and clip that gold off of there. And so they had to remove it and put something similar or some semblance thereof. You see, my point is, is that we are promised riches in glory and the Bible talks about according to his riches and glory that he gives us the blessing of every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Ephesians 1. And so what we're seeing is, is we're seeing that this is a fruit. The fruit of faith is that we will love. It's natural, it's a feeling, and it's something that's very real. Uh, and these people had, had a faith that was fostered by a beloved minister. Look at verse 7. It says, uh, As you also learned uh, uh, from or of Epaphroditus, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister. Now, there's a couple of things I want you to pick up on. First of all, this word minister is going to come up again and again. He says that he was a minister to them first. Paul's never met this group. That's why he says in chapter 2 that he wants them to know what great conflict he had for you and as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. So he says, not only was Epaphras your faithful ministry, but in verse 23, he says, I am made a minister of the gospel. Verse 25, he says, and I'm made a minister to the church. So they have many ministers. Now, why do you have ministers? Well, because your feeler won't take you all the way through. You you won't get there on feelings. A lot of people get feelings and they get excited. We remember, as it were, those parable, that parable of the soils. How that some of the seed fell upon thorn, among thorns, some upon stony ground, that they were great, they received the word with gladness quickly. There was feelings, but because there was no root in the stony ground, because they were in the midst of the thorns of cares of this world and pleasures and so forth, that they were choked or that they were scorched. Uh, and we saw that there was gladness, but it can't get you from here to home. You have to dig in. You have to nurture your faith. You have to cultivate it. And the Bible says faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the the word of God. Now, these guys only had Epiphras so far, and, 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 and usurpers had come into their midst, and they began to solicit them to liturgy and mysticism, and everybody likes things that they can, uh, you know, check a list off on, that they can manage, that they can personally get their mind around. And this is why Paul takes uh, great pains to bring to them truth. And if you were to catalog how he lays out many of his, uh, his, his epistles, you'll find he'll lay out a whole lot of doctrine doctrine and let them know who they are and how they're saints as he does here and how wonderful he's how pleased he is with them and and all of that and he'll show about Jesus being the image of the invisible God and show them all these neat doctrinal things only to turn around and say now that you know how much God loves you and how he's provided for you now you need to do your duty (laughs) you see belief will begin to give way to behavior 
Doctrine requires duty. This is why many don't like to teach doctrine in, in churches today because sometimes it requires a response. But Paul is not worried about that. He just says, listen, look who Jesus is. Look who you are. Look what God has done for you. He's made you fit to be partakers of the inheritance with the saints in light. He is the one who's redeemed you and reconciled you. He's the one who loves you. <laughs> I mean, if you can just get your mind around that, it'll take the bite out of the difficulty to which you are called. We are called to go upstream. You know, we, we were in a, a canoeing trip one time and the water was so low that we had to get out and kind of pull it through certain levels, certain places. At one point, we actually were, had to go back and get some things and, you know, we had to walk because you couldn't, couldn't, you know, paddle back up in certain other areas. And, you know, the, the issues of hardship are part and parcel of the Christian life. We need to recognize that. If you go in expecting it, it won't be any shock. Peter says, think it not strange, the fiery trial which is to try you, right? Uh, the Bible talks about that we're supposed to glory in our tribulations. And it talks about the fact that our, the trial of our faith is more precious than gold. Why? Because there's going to be trials. There's going to be difficulty. You know, if you go in looking for that, when you get some, they won't bother you so much. But if you go in thinking everything's going to be rosy and easy street, man, you're going to be blown away. Christian life is not for the faint of heart. And what we're seeing is he's saying to them that he was pleased with their faith. He was pleased with their faith. What he had saw in their faith and what he had seen in their faith was that they had love. And it was all for the right reasons. It was for the hope. This world is a passing away in the fashion thereof. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, they are not of the Father, but they are of the world, and they are passing away. You and I live in a world that is very fragile. If it doesn't fully pass away in our lifetime, we will. <laughs> because that's what happens to this old body and this flesh. But reality is, is that when we get saved, we have a hope that goes beyond this world. And when you understand that, you will, you will be able to re revel in the bounty of the riches of what Christ has provided for you and for me. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And one asked him, well, Lord, how do we know the way? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's a hope. That's a hope. Now, I recognize that you and I have a strong, wandering spirit in this day. You can get into a movie. You can get into a game. You can get into a sport. You can get into a hobby. You can chase it for all it's worth. You cannot rest at night waiting to get up in the morning so you can get to the next thing, you know, in our hobbies and in involvements. It's huge. It's not like it was for nearly 1,800 years since Christ. And then all of a sudden, boom, we have more things coming all the time. For you, for me, we are inundated with stimulation. And so what we do is we forget how we felt when we got saved sometimes. We forget the love that we had. And sometimes we allow ourselves to get caught up in our hobbies because we like certain verses better than others. Certain verses that say, all things are lawful for me. <laughs> Wait a minute. It says, yeah, but not everything is expedient. Not everything is profitable. We like certain verses that tell us, you know, he will not cast us out. Okay, well, I can go chase butterflies. Yeah, you can. But the problem is going to be that you're not going to go deeper as God wants you to. What is the title of the message? Perfect in Christ. You'll never understand true perfection in Christ until you understand some of the things that Paul reveled in with these people. He was pleased with their faith. Not only was he pleased with their faith, because as far as it had come, it was a, per, a, a, a joy to behold. Uh, the Bible says that they had love for the saints in verse 4, and it was for the hope. And it says not only did they uh, have this faith come in, and it was active, and it had an impact, but in verse 6 it says that it brought forth fruit in their lives. Now, the fruit that it brought forth was the love. That's all you can bring forth at the beginning. You know, you don't know much 
Uh, there was a story told years ago about a, a revival that was taking place somewhere in the backwoods, you know, of some small town in, in the hills, you know, or Virginia or somewhere like that. And this one man who could hear, but he was um, not able to speak, but he was really lit up. And he got saved one night in this campaign of meetings, but he, he couldn't talk, <laughs> but he was so full of love, he had to do something. So what he did was he wrote him up a sign and it says, please come to the meeting. And he went out to a certain road. There wasn't much traffic there. And he began to realize people were going by so fast that when they did see him, they didn't really notice because they're blowing by him. So what he did was he moved on up the road a little bit where there was a hairpin turn. And he went right on the hairpin turn and he had his sign and he stepped right out in front of people. (laughs) And people would come to the meeting because he was so full of love and he just had to tell somebody. Don't we need to do that? Don't we need to reach out sometimes and do what we can? Doesn't the love of Christ constrain us? Because that's what it should do. It is something that can be spooked back into its, into its corner. We don't want to involve ourselves or interject ourselves into other people's lives sometimes. We want, to, we want to not offend. And in our day, it's even more of a spirit of the age not to offend. Not to in any way make somebody feel bad about whether they would go to heaven or to hell or ask them about their salvation. But he says, no, you had the right kind of faith. It brought forth fruit. Now, verse 10 talks about being fruitful, and we're going to see that. And he says, uh, again, he talks about this fruit later in a different way. But what it did was it brought forth fruit. And it says that you had a, uh, a, and I want to make another connection up in this section before I move past it. He says, you, he says, we heard of your faith and your love to all the saints and for the hope that was laid up for you. And he says that you uh, therefore became uh, people who were fruitful in every good work, verse 10. That good work is going to come into play, but I want to give you the heading for this section. Not only is he pleased with their faith, but he prays for their faith. Now, I say these things as we're diving back into chapter 1 a little bit. Why? Because we could get so bogged down in who Christ was. We could get so bogged down in how awesome God was to us that we forget the whole point. Why did he tell them that? Why did he go to the heights and tell us how Jesus was the Prototokos? He was the firstborn of all creation. How he made everything. How God himself you know, redeemed us. How God himself made us fit to be partakers. All of these big, high, lofty truths. Why? Because he was championing their faith. He was trying to perfect them. And the word perfect literally has the idea of not the perfection you and I think of. It means to be brought to its intended end. You might write that somewhere. When you read the Bible and it talks about being perfect in Christ or you are perfect in Him, the word literally means to be brought to the intended end. What did God intend for you and for me? A little boy was asked that in a catechism class, and he thought he knew this. He squared his shoulders, and he was asked the question. He knew it was coming. He was asked him the question, what is the sole purpose of man? And it says, well, it, 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 it's to glorify God and to annoy Him forever. <laughs> no, no, it's not to annoy Him forever. It's to enjoy Him forever. See, that's the catechism. Is it true? I think it is. In many ways, we find that all throughout the scriptures. Yes, somebody can take a catechism, or we could just read our Bibles. <laughs> we can find it out there. But the fact is, is that you and I are to glorify God and to enjoy Him. Are you enjoying the Lord today? You know, you have to ask, well, I'm enjoying Him. No, well, push, come to shove. How much did we enjoy Him last week? Well, I'll tell you what, that's what God's goal is for us. It's part of His intended end. And the perfect saint is one that needs to uh, come along in their faith. So he was pleased with their faith as far as it had gone. But then in verse 9, it says, uh, For this cause we also pray for you. So he prayed for their faith. What did he pray? He prayed and desired that they would be filled with knowledge, verse 9, of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, uh, that they might walk worthy. See, so there's, he's saying, your faith, it's feeling now. That's good. Go with that. Hold that thought. But move forward and add to your faith virtue and to your virtue knowledge. Virtue is basically uh, having behaviors, you know, that follow it up. You know, kindness and, and being, uh, being truthful and honest in all your dealings, having integrity, cultivating character. Add to your faith virtue. 
And to your virtue, knowledge. Now we're getting somewhere. And so he adds some things. And he says, I'm praying that you're going to get some knowledge. I'm praying that you'll have knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding in verse 9. And they, in order that, the word that there is hina in Greek. And it means in order that you might walk worthy of the Lord. Now, what was their problem? They weren't walking worthy of the Lord presently. You see, they had love and they got a good goose bump, you know, and it was all good. And those goose bumps are awesome. You know, we like those when they come around. You know, you get, they used to talk about the bees making honey on the back of your head because you'd be like, man, God is so good. You'd be in the in gospel sing and you'd be lit up and things were good. But the fact is, is a goose bump is not all there is to this thing. There's some real shoe leather that has to come into play. And he says, I want you to walk. He says, I want you to get this knowledge so that you will walk. Worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Circle the word increasing because this is what he's doing. He's pleased with their faith as far as it had gone. He sees them getting off the rails because Epaphras had told them, uh, told him that they were you know, getting solicited to liturgies of the Jews and mysticism of their past. And he's, he's saying, no, he says, you need to increase in the knowledge of God. Fruit always will come from works. And when you see it in verse 10 mentioned that it is fruitful in every good work, uh, understand there are good works and there are wicked works. <laughs> Let your eye fall into the verse, uh, down to verse 21. He says, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. So you have good works in verse 10, or you can have wicked works. And the word wicked has the idea of painful, cumbersome, uh, culpable works. The kind that, you know, where you do things that stumble other people. Where you do things that solicit other people to sin. Where you do things that really perpetuate a sinful, uh, what we would say, paradigm in our world. The whole world rejoices in wickedness. Chapter 1 of the book of Romans talks about those who have become insensitized, desensitized to sin. Not only do things that are evil, but they also have pleasure in other people who do them. They rejoice in other people who do them. And we have to be mindful that there are good works and there are wicked works. And the word for good here in verse 10 is the word for agathos. If you ever met a girl named Agatha, it meant goodness. That's what her name means. We don't use that word, but those names are coming back around more and more now. I'm hearing more and more of the names that used to be bygone coming back around. And so we see uh, Agathos works, good works, in, in, intrinsically good. And he says, now listen. He says, I want you, I pray for you that you'll walk worthy unto the, uh, of the Lord unto all pleasing. Listen, being fruitful being fruitful in every good work. So now we're past feelings. And he says, we're walking, we're past feelings. And when you engage in your Christian life, take a sign, put it on a hairpin curve, hazard life and limb. Man, those people crazy. That people crazy out there driving around. He's out there in the sign. You know, that's fearful. But he did it. And some things you've done have scared you, man. I put some tracks in somebody's hand or... Told somebody I'd like them to come to church, or I talked to them about, yeah I, I, yeah, I go to church. Yeah, you want to do something? I said, no, Sunday's not good for me. I'm in church. You know, and you know, those first few times where you stepped onto that thin ice of what, how are they going to receive this? It was there, but you walked and you kept walking. And it says, you're going to be therefore fruitful under every, in every good work because there's a lot to do. Isn't there a lot to do? A lot of people to do things for. People who are shut in, people who are sick, people who are sad, people who are down in the dumps. Uh, new people whose marriages are on the rocks. People are in the world of, in a world of debris. People are hemorrhaging in this train wreck down here. And so what we can do is we can do some good. I bought a box of candy this past week. And it was good. It was a cheap box of candy. I was getting creamer, and I saw the candy. I had to get the creamer, and there was candy there. It's a big box of candy. It was a good box of candy. It's almost gone now. But it was 30 pieces of this new candy. But you know what I did with that candy? I gave some of it away to people who I thought, they need to pick me up. 
Hey, tap one of these. In fact, I gave one to the girl who sold it to me because I felt so guilty buying that box of candy. No, I thought people need to be encouraged. So you give somebody a piece of candy and they're encouraged. I remember once a guy did me a favor. And I had a big, big jug of sweet tea in my car. I said, man, that was so here. Have this sweet tea. I gave him a jug of sweet tea. He was, man, this is great. He's just helping me with what he knew. He was helping me with my stereo. It wasn't working or my, something like that. My point is, is that you and I can do some good. And it can be real simple. When I would go to work in Cleveland, I would always have these little nuggets. See, I'm back on the candy again. The chocolate, milk chocolate nuggets. Listen, listen. It had nuts in there and it had toffee in there. Can I get an amen? All right, I got five of you. That's good. That's good. But I would go, you think it's good now, just thinking about it. I had them in my, in my, in my, in my lunchbox. And when we would have our breaks, I'd throw one at guys. Give them one. Hey, 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 man, thank you. They were nice to me the rest of the day. But it was just a little pick-me-up. But they knew me from day to day. So just being nice in a kind way, kindness, would help whatever my personal responsibility as a witness uh, would, it would help facilitate it. You and I can, we can uh, angle ourselves, you know. Uh, what I'm saying is, is that these people needed to be prayed for for their faith. And you and I need that. We need to remember, your faith isn't done the moment you get saved. You're going to be solicited to something other than the true and the right. And it's going to be easy for you to find a list somewhere. When people say, listen, here, uh, here's your sacraments. And they give you seven sacraments. If you do these, you're pretty much for sure you're going to make it to heaven one day. You know? uh, or they might have a list of any other things, you know, that many other things that are out there. And, uh, and maybe it's an experience. You know, you'll go to some places and they'll say you have to have some supernatural manifestation of the Holy Spirit in your life. I'll tell you what, the manifestation of the Spirit in my life is He saved me. (laughs) Is that He translated me from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His Son. That was the supernatural experience. That I was baptized by one Spirit into one body. And I was made to drink of that Spirit. And that was said to a Corinthian church that was a mess. He says, this is what you've done. It's what I've done. I've been baptized by the Spirit and I've been uh, made to drink of the Spirit. And the Bible says, if any man now has not the Spirit of Christ, he is not any of his. You can't have a little dab of Jesus and get a second blessing. When you get saved, you get it all, (laughs) okay? You are complete in Christ. And that's important to know. Because if you get people giving you, okay, well, we'll do this, do this, do this, do this. And you can't do anything to add to your salvation. But what you can do is you can drill down and find out how good it is. And he prayed for them that they would be fruitful unto or in every good work in verse 10. And he says, increasing thereby in the knowledge of God. You know, it is awesome to behold the cross. It is awesome to behold Calvary and to understand that my sin was placed on him. I should have died, but he died for me. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It should have been me. Blessed are they that mourn. It should have been me. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. There He is. Jesus is my righteousness. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. I collect myself. I see what He did. Blessed are the merciful. I begin to tell somebody else about my Savior. And I become blessed are the peacemakers. You see, the peacemakers are the ones who begin to put one hand on... But you won't do that unless you come to the place where you realize He keeps on giving. He keeps on getting better and better. The world may fail us. People may disappoint us. Life may be hard. And in fact, it will be hard sometimes because the only way to get the world's attention is for the believer to go through a crucible that they sit back and watch us do, you know? Uh, Sometimes the life of a Christian is such that the world has to watch a a, a slow-motion train wreck and then watch the recovery. Because, you know, the Bible, as, as it says in 2 Corinthians 1, Paul said we had the sentence of death in ourselves. And he says that we might trust in, not in ourselves, but in God who what? Raises The dead. He said, we had the sense of death. We were done. But God raised me back up. His mercies are new every morning. This is what we find. He is good all the time. And He's good all the way. 
Now, we may have to go through some hard times. Jesus knew God was still good even when he was carrying the cross and stumbling under its weight. He knew God was still good even when the lashes of the cat of nine tails ripped his flesh. He knew it. Paul knew that God was good even as he laid his head over the, the block where they would dismember him through the removal of his head, the decapitation that would take place on the day of his martyrdom. You see, we know God's good because this is not all there is. And Jesus invaded history. And he says, we need now that we've got this 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 outpouring of the Spirit, the love of God shed abroad in our hearts, Romans 5, 5. He says, now what we need to do is we need to be pleasing unto God in all things, being fruitful in every good work, and thereby increasing in the knowledge of God. Many times our faith turns to stone because we're not doing anything. It's real easy to get saved and get our get-out-of-hell-free card and put it in our back pocket and move on down the road and forget uh, how it is to really love on Jesus. But when you begin to love on Jesus, He begins to show up. He shows up in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He shows up with Joshua in the battle of Jericho. He shows up with the priests when they put their feet in the Jordan and walked across. He shows up when we're doing something. We see when, it, uh, when Abraham sent his servant, Eliezer, to go get a bride for his son, he said, I being in the way, the Lord led me. You see, that's how it works. You don't get Jesus and then, you know, he's, it, it, it's a static reality. We have to stir up the pot a little bit, you know, do something a little about outside of our comfort zone. These guys were beginning to stray because they weren't beginning to serve. If we're not serving, we'll find ourselves straying in many uh, cases. And he says you need to do this because you are seeking deeper knowledge. You want deeper knowledge? It's found in serving God. You want deeper knowledge? It's found in doing things for Jesus. It's found in doing things for the Lord Jesus. Now, the church is not where that's done. The church is where we gather to be taught. And you can practice your gifts and your, your abilities right here. You practice forgiveness one with another. You practice being kind one to another. But you go out into the world and you take those skills, those virtues, and you show the world that in your life. You go to the neighbor who just moved in with some cookies that you really didn't have time to cook. You help a guy who needs a, who, who, who needs a jump uh, on the side of the road or pushed out of a ditch. I'll tell you, one day here, about a month ago, I had a lady who came in, and I was picking up a part for my car, and she was came into Advance Auto, and she said, I need a can of Fix-A-Flat. And I'm in the straight now, because that's the most ridiculous stuff they ever invented. It messes up your tire, and if you take it to the tire people, they say, man, you've just ruined this tire by putting that in there. Some of you may know that, but I can't say that, because this is a place of business, and I can't undermine what she's just asked for. But I'm seeing her, and she's got this girl who's about 12 or 13. And so as I'm leaving, I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking, what can I do? I can't really say anything at this point. She's got all these men in here who could give her a hand or tell her. And so I drive away, and I realize as I drive away, because I had a few things to do around back, getting rid of some extra oil, I, I, I realize there she is, sitting on the side of the road. And she's got a real flat tire. That can't fix flat, ain't going to do it. <laughs> so I ran home and I got my jumper box and I went back. Why'd she have a flat tire that day? Because somebody needed to go give them some tracks. And I went in there and this other guy had stopped, so he needed a track too. He was changing the tire, so I didn't have to change the tire. But I was there with my blow-up machine, you know, the little inflator, and I talking to him and I said, here, let me give you something to read. And the 13-year-old got a track, the lady got a track, and she's letting some really bad language come up. Until I told her I was a pastor. And she's like, well, yes, pastor. Yes, thank you so much for stopping. <laughs> but she got a tract, and the guy who stopped as a nice guy got a tract. My point is this. We don't know why God's doing things in our lives. Why does he put things in your life? We go out into the world to be salt. And what? Light. We turn the light on. And we turn it on sometimes by suffering nobly. Sometimes we do it just by doing good works. If we're not suffering, we should be serving. This is the whole point of this whole new uh, world in which we live politically. You didn't get a reprieve so you could, you know, pad your bank account, which may happen. And it may happen to the detriment of many. 
In the days of Jeroboam II, who was one of the last kings in the northern kingdom, everything was on the upswing. It was all good. Because God had a promise to keep to Jehu, his grandfather. But it was right before he went off the scene that they were high grass, man. Everything was good. And then they were carried away by the Assyrians. You see, we need to still be light. We need to serve even though it is pretty much more of a, a, a reprieve from all of the things we were seeing written as writing on the wall for our country. All of that stuff's going to come around again. We just now have a little time. So he says, if you want deeper knowledge, verse 10, he says, you need to be fruitful in every good work and increase in the knowledge of God. That's what I'm praying for you. I'm praying you'll get to know God more, get to know God better, get to feel the sense of his presence in your life because you have gotten a hold of what necessarily needs to be added to your faith. Add to your faith virtue, to your virtue knowledge. And that knowledge, the word for knowledge in verse 10 is the word epigenosco. Epi means upon. It actually has been uh, interpreted by many as meaning super knowledge, the super knowledge of God. What did they want? They were worshiping angels. They were keeping feast days. They wanted deeper knowledge. They wanted something that was manageable. He says, you want to see God in your life? He says, you need to, you need to do some good works. Be fruitful unto all pleasing on every good work. Uh, an increase in the word of, in, in the knowledge of God. So he's saying this: love is the catalyst, and if you don't capitalize on that love that God has shed abroad in your heart, it will turn to stone. So what you need to do is you need to realize love is the catalyst. And after you access this catalyst and you begin to serve people, you'll find a deeper knowledge of God. And fruit of this of this is continuance. You remember where he said, you know, you've done so well, he says, if you continue. Look in verse, in, verse, uh, in verse 23, it says, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled and so forth. He says, God has made you unblameable, verse 22, unreprovable in his sight and all that. He says he do, did that so, that so that he could commend you to the world. He made you to have a standing that was impeccable and unimpeachable before himself. He says, listen, I am for you, and if God be for us, who can be against us? We are more than conquerors through them who are in Christ. We are more than conquerors who are in Christ Jesus. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Bible says we are seated above the principalities and powers. What an amazing standing and position we have. And he says, those things are all true. God wants you to stand before him, unreprovable, unblameable, unimpeachable, and so forth in his sight. And he says, this will be true of you if you continue. How do you continue? You continue by having uh, this love catalyst take place in your life. You dig down by service into deeper knowledge, and the fruit will be continuance. And what happens then? Go back up to verse 11. He says, strengthened with all might. You want to have the experience of God in your life. You're going to be strengthened when God shows up. We're talking this morning in my Sunday school class a little bit about the millennial kingdom because a question kind of dovetailed into it. We went to Dan Daniel chapter 12 and we saw this uh, 1290 days and this 1335 days and we see that Jesus has a plan and it just enthuses our soul. It infuses us with that joy to know that there's 1,260 days of great tribulation, 1,290 days for him to cleanse the temple, and then 1,200 or 1,335 days he will have established his full kingdom. And we're there. We're home. And it's on time because God never fails. It's just blessed is he who comes to the 1,335 days. I'm telling you, these are things that are deep knowledge, thrill the soul, strengthen us when the world throws things at me and says, you know what? Really? You really believe in God? You really, be I, I, uh, you know, you get a little punch drunk sometimes because the world keeps throwing that nonsense at you. And I think, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah, I do. I do because he's proven himself to be awesome and good. And I've seen the cross with the heart of my heart, and from the, with the eyes of my heart. And I've reveled in the knowledge that he's coming again. The Bible says that our blessed hope involves looking for and hastening unto the great day of, our, of the appearing of our great God and Savior. He's coming again. And this is why they got saved. They got saved by faith and it created love and it was for the hope. So he is pleased with their faith as far as it had gone. He prays for their faith because he wants it to come uh, fully into fruition, which means to be uh, increasing in the knowledge of God. 
And he says this uh, in Colossians. I want to kind of bring this in here because I want you to recognize he strengthens us as a consequence. Love, then we do some good works, then we get knowledge of God deeper, and then we're strengthened. Where does that begin? Where does that begin? Charity begins at home. You take, for instance, Ephesians. He gives a whole host of things about doctrine, what we have in Christ, how it is that we're so blessed. And then he says, now, wives, submit yourself to your husbands. (laughs) Husbands, love your wives. Look at chapter 3 and verse 17. He gives a whole lot of doctrine. He gives some correction in chapter 2 about the worshiping of angels. And he says, no, lay up some for yourself treasures in heaven. In in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, that's where you need to be focusing. And he says in verse 17, uh, or in verse 17, whatsoever you do, do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So now that you've got your knowledge and your wisdom and your strength and all that in order, and you're, you're moving forward in that, he says, do this. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of the Father, if you will. Then it says in verse 18, wives, submit yourselves. And it says, husbands, love your wives. You know what's interesting about that verse? I just, I'm just going to give you a little tipping of the hand here because this has been interesting to me to read. In verse 19, it says in chapter 3, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Why does it say that? <laughs> I believe that what I've seen in my experience in dealing with marriage, uh, people, people in their marriages and so forth, is that I, I, I believe that men tend to not get bitter as easily as ladies because ladies get hurt feelings really bad and they don't have a lot of power to fix that, so they get hurt feelings. So their bitterness, they get hurt quick. And so they have to work through that a lot more often. It's like all the time. <laughs> they always are working through that because that's easy to get hurt because they got all these feelers. But what about a guy? When it says, guys, be not bitter, it takes a lot for a guy to get bitter. I mean, they get hurt, but they just go to their cave. Uh, it talks about better to go to a corner of a house stop, right? They just go to the corner of a house stop. But they don't get bitter because they like their wives. Man, their wives bring so much to their lives. But if they get to the place where they're bitter, they're bitter for a long, long time. And I thought that was an interesting little morsel for me to ponder because we have to be careful, fellows, not to get bitter in our marriages. And the Bible tells us that where, and this is my point in the message, is that this is where charity begins. It begins at home. Wives submitting, husbands loving, and we have to understand that this is where it starts because we practice the virtues at home. Kindness, speaking the truth in love, caring for one another, forgiving one another, being tender-hearted one with another, not giving, rendering, railing for railing and evil for evil. No. He says, you, you, you guys got to know this. This is what it is. You guys love when you get saved. God gives you a new love. But you need to dig down and you need to find the knowledge of God. You won't find it if you're not adding to your faith virtue and so forth. So back to chapter 1, what he does is he shows us that this is, this is real deal stuff we need to pray through. I'm pleased with your faith as far as it's gone, but I'm praying for your faith that it will go deeper. Now he talks about providing for their faith. Verse, 20, uh, verse 23, look at that in chapter 1. He says, this is all good. You know, God's given you this great position. He's made you a certain kind of person in verse 22. And he says, this will be something he will present you, in verse 22, before the world, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not removed from the the hope of the gospel which you heard. Now, when he says from the hope, it was earlier in the passage, back up in in verse 5, where he says you got saved and had exercised faith for the hope. And he says, now what's happening is you're being removed from the hope. And that's important to recognize. But Paul is, Paul is telling them that they have control over whether they're going to get more knowledge or whether they're going to get strengthened. And he says, right now you're straying, you're not serving. And he says, so you need to continue grounded and settled, for that's what he was praying for them for. But he's also providing for it because he says now... This is what you can do, is you can do that. He says, but I am, a, I am Paul made a minister for you. I am Paul made a minister of the gospel, in verse 23, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. 
So what he's saying is, is he's saying you, you uh, have a call to continue. It may be hard, and that's where things turn to stone, and now they're, they're not serving their strength. He says, it's hard. You get up every day and the world hits you with very, uh, very powerful, you know, uh, motivations to sin. There's a solicitation from the flesh, solicitation from the devil, solicitations from the systems of the world. Here you are in the midst of a barrage of difficulty. But you can continue and it will be hard, you know. The Bible tells us that it's, you know, you, you, you can't be conformed to this world, poured into its mold. You have to present your bodies. That's, you know, active. Romans 12, a living sacrifice. But what is he saying? He's saying, I made him, he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for you. And he says, and I fill up in my body that which is lacking uh, of, the affli- uh, of the afflictions of Christ. It's not that Christ didn't do everything necessary for salvation. It's just that it's not done. It's not done. He's, he did everything necessary for salvation, but salvation is constantly, every time a new generation comes along, salvation needs to be propagated again and again and again. And so God says, you are boots in the ground, you're the body of Christ, and now you go out there and you show them Jesus in your life. I want to read a passage that's kind of interesting about this because he tells us, he tells us in verse uh, in verse. 28, that he preaches warning every man as a preacher. He says, I preach warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom. And he says that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Now, how did, how, how do we get to that perfect thing? Remember what it means. It means to come to its intended end. And I want to read a passage out of uh, Hebrews chapter 5 and verses 8 and 9. You might put this in your margin by perfect in Christ in verse 28. But this is an interesting co- connection Hebrews 5 and verses 8 and 9 says, Though he were a son, Jesus, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto them that obey him. Isn't that interesting? He became perfect. Was he less than perfect? No. He's not made perfect in, intrinsically because he was perfect. But what he was made was he was made perfect in the sense that when I look at him, I'm not raising an eyebrow anymore because I see he knows what I've gone through. I see he knows what it is to die. I see he knows what it is to suffer. I see he knows what it is to be lonely, to be rejected, to be misunderstood, to be hated. He knows what it is to be dissociated with. There is not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. And so when he calls us to be perfect, he's calling us to be presented. He wants us to get to the place where we're presented uh, perfect in Christ Jesus. If you look at Jesus, how was he made perfect in the eyes of the world? It was through his sufferings. You see, no other religion would have ever conjured the idea of Almighty God coming in, divesting himself of all of his prerogatives of deity and suffering for us. And it just stops you up short, pushes you back on your heels, and you're like, what? But then you look at it, and you think, what did he say before all that happened? Now we're talking. Now let's go see what he said. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We're a mess. Blessed are those who mourn. And man, I don't even know how to do life, because I I know I'm going to die. You remember the old movie? I never saw it, but I mean, every time I hear people talk about it, it's like, oh, the biggest tearjerker ever. Old yeller. Old yeller. They had to put old Yeller down. If you're a child and you're nine years old and you have to put old Yeller down, that blows the senses all away. And a little boy could get fixated on the fact that what? What about us? Are, are we going to? What? Are we going to die? They say if a child loses a parent at ages eight or nine, that can be very traumatic if it's not navigated well, because they just they just can't negotiate such lofty thoughts. My point is, is that he is providing for their faith by saying, I rejoice now, back to chapter 1. He says, I rejoice now in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind in the afflictions of Christ. He says, you think you're going to get a pass, get saved, you know, get that love thing going on, but then you're going to stray and start creating paradigms that really have nothing to do with what Jesus was intending to do. He says, what I want you to do is I want you to become perfect in Christ. I want to preach, I want to warn And I want to present every man. 
I want to present every man perfect in Christ. To bring them to their fully intended end. What did God save you for? Why are we redeemed? What is the purpose of man? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. The deeper knowledge will buoy you up. Paul is in prison and he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for you. And that idea of rejoicing is set before us where he says that we were saved unto uh, being willing to be uh, afflicted unto uh, with joy. And I don't have that verse marked for you, but it's in the passage. And so what I want you to see at this point is I want you to see that Jesus was made perfect through sufferings. Jesus was made perfect externally to the world. His testimony was buoyed up, punctuated, if you will, put on display by the sufferings that Jesus did. And Paul says, I'm now rejoicing in my sufferings because I can tell you where have I speak. You remember last week when we were looking out of Acts, I think it's chapter 14, where he was stoned with stones. He goes into the city, he kind of cleans himself up, comes back the next day and says, listen, we, must, we, with, we, we through much tribulation must enter into the kingdom. He's telling it as a, from a platform of legitimacy. He says, I just, you saw what I just went through. You may have to do that. We make the connection also, since we're in a time of prosperity, we may not be called to suffer, but we are called to serve. Might write that down somewhere. If you're not called to suffer right now, you are called to serve right now. That is how you do every good work. You know, walk worthy unto every good work so that you might get more knowledge of God and be strengthened. If you're not suffering, then you're serving. Paul's singing in the in the in the jail cell in Acts 16 and the gates breaking open and the, ga- and, and, and the prison guard getting saved. That's what happens when you go through suffering. His back's bloody, he can't sleep, he's singing. When he's, you got nothing to sing about, man. You just lost everything. You had a ministry for a few weeks and here you are in jail. Look at your back. He said, I, yeah, I know, but amazing grace how sweet the sound. Right? This is, this is it. When you're hurting and you got tears playing in the corner of your eyes, you find that song because God is good even if the world's not. And that's what he's calling them to. And so what he does is he says he wants them to see that he owns this conflict. He says, I rejoice in my sufferings for you. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. He says, For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you, and for all who have not seen my face in the flesh. You see, the point is, is he's saying, I want you to know that what I'm going through is not for nothing, and what you're going through is not for nothing, because God would have every man perfect and presented to the world. Again, he said, he, he, he wants to present us unblameable, unreprovable, unimpeachable, and blameless in his sight. He wants to present us to the world that way. So he gives us a perfect standing. And he says, I'm a minister of this gospel. And you've been moved in verse 23 of 1 from the hope. And he says, I want you to know, not only I rejoice in my sufferings, because that's a good example for you, but I want you to know what great conflict I have for you all the time. Why? Why? verse 2 of chapter 2, that your hearts might be comforted. That's parakaleo. It means to call alongside, to put your par- a, a, a paramedic, as somebody is a, beside the medic, you know, and they get words from the medic. He says, I'm coming right alongside. I want you to be comforted. I want you to know that whatever you're going through, others have gone through is the same time, uh, 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 the same kind of thing. And it says, being knit together in love, because when all else falls away, what do you have left if you don't have love? This is why the body of Christ is so important. When you serve, I often call it foxhole fellowship. If you'll do something with somebody else for Christ's sake, which is first of all done in the home. The Bible says rejoice with the wife of your youth. Keep your all garments always spotless. And that's in a context of being soul winners as a couple. Invite people to your table and pray over your food. Laugh and have a good time. Play some games, but show them Jesus in the details and the minutia of your life. As a couple, when it says rejoice with the wife of your youth in Ecclesiastes, I believe it's chapter 9, it literally means to see with the wife of your youth. See with her. Look together. Uh, 1 Peter 3 talks about give honor unto the wife. You co-laborers, join heirs together uh, of the grace of life. You have the opportunity to arm and arm this thing. You are the number one uh, resource that some people are looking at. They're saying, how is it you guys even get along? How is it you guys do that? Because I know how hard it is 
to get along with a guy or how hard it is I get along with a woman. You know, somebody said it well. It was a comedian. He was making fun of it. But he says, you know, these people who want the same sex thing. He says, you cowards. <laughs> he says, you know what a guy's like. He says, but a woman. Now, that's, that's, that's man, that's bold. You get with a woman because he says, my wife just freaks me out all the time. And he was making the point, wasn't he? If we can learn how to get along and go along and do life together with the same momentum in the same direction, then we're doing it, listen, perfectly. We bring them to our table. We show them our lives. We show them our heart. We show them our love. And we let them see. Someone has said, if they'll hear the, 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 the music of your life, maybe there will be an opportunity then to get the lyrics. Don't you want them to get the lyrics? That Jesus saves? And he says, you're going to be, he says, I, I'm glad you know because I want you to be comforted, verse 2. I want you to uh, be knit together in love. Listen to this. Unto all riches, which is what they really wanted. They wanted deeper knowledge. Of the full assurance of understanding. To the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. And of the Father and of Jesus Christ. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom. <laughs> There's nothing like having the treasures of wisdom in Jesus. He had the deeper wisdom, didn't he? The devil, I don't know what he was thinking. The only thing I can think is, when he was putting Jesus on the cross, he had to know he was going to rise again unless God just foiled his mind like he puts a cloud over people's mind. But on the third day, Jesus broke the grave open and he conquered death. And the devil lost. Sometimes I've pondered the idea of thinking of it this way. Maybe he was just throwing everything but the kitchen sink at him. In the, in the scourging with the cat of nine tails, pieces of bone and metal ripping his flesh apart, with the beating and the smacking and the blindfolding and the crown of thorns and the pulling out of the beard and the spitting in the face and the kicking in the gut and the punching in the face. He says, P, he says to Peter, don't you know I could call my father right now and he'd send 10,000 angels and he would deliver me? But for this cause I came into the world. And so all of that stuff being thrown at him, perhaps the devil was trying to provoke him, get out of here, you don't want to do this. And he threw everything he could at him. And the Bible tells us in, in, in Isaiah 52, his face was marred more than any man's. So I, can, I want to just suggest to you that what we do see is that there's treasury to be had and treasury to be uh, plundered in Christ, in your experience. And when we see that he tells us that the greatest apogee of all of this wisdom, this mystery, he connects the mystery to this when he says the acknowledgement of the mystery in verse 2. He's referring us back to verse 27 of chapter 1. He says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Understand, the fact that Christ is in you and in me, and we have this perfect standing, is the, it, it, it shouts to the world around us that they too can be saved. That there is a hope that they too can access. That Christ in you is the hope of glory for them. The Bible says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's what holds you up in your day to day. But it's also to the world the evidence of things not seen. They don't know about eternity. They haven't read John chapter 14 about in my father's house there are many mansions. I prepare a place for you. All that. They don't know. But they look at you and they say, man, there's something different. Why are they walking different? Well, it's because they had faith. It gave them love. And they began to walk unto the Lord in all pleasing. They got strengthened. They got Deeper knowledge, they are convinced that He is real. And that is what God wants in every man to have as a believer, that we might be presented perfect in Christ. You are the evidence of things not seen. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, again, or half chapter 11, and verse 2, it says, For by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. From their, from their generation. You get to obtain a good report in yours. Beloved, for you and me, God would have us to be perfect in Christ. Presented perfect to the world in Christ. God's job, He's already made us perfect. 
He wants to now present us perfect. Paul preaches warning and exhorting and teaching every man that he might present every man perfect. And the perfect, the, the, the intended end God has for you and me is that we would refer, uh, reflect to the world that there is a hope of glory. Hope of glory. Would you bow with me for a moment?